Good evening, and welcome to Bunker Hill Baptist Church and our Sunday night service. My name is Will Jordan. I'm the associate pastor here at the church. And so I want to welcome you if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube or wherever you happen to be joining us from. A couple of announcements tonight. By this time, we have gathered for our first in-person service. So we rejoice in that. We can't wait till we continue to open up the rest of the church. Before the month of June, we're going to continue on Sunday nights, live streaming, and Wednesday nights with our prayer service while we record and live stream and broadcast that out on social media. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for being patient. It won't be long soon for we'll come back to some sense of normalcy, but until then, thank you for joining us. In our prayer request tonight, we want to remember Ms. Lori Shuck as she continues to battle uh, in her healing uh, with what she has there in her lungs. So continue to pray for her. Continue to pray for this nation, uh, for our church, and for our community. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you tonight that we can gather, whether virtually in your house, God, thank you for this message. Thank you tonight for those that have tuned in. God, I pray for each and every one that has tuned in tonight, that they may receive a blessing tonight, that they may receive your word to take as they go throughout this week. So God, I just lift up those that are burdened on their hearts, burdened on my heart. God, we just pray for your healing in these situations. Above all, we pray for your will to be done. We pray for your kingdom come. God, we look at our country, we look at our world, dealing with viruses, dealing uh, with situations, Lord God, and we just pray, God, that your will be done in all these situations. And we realize that no matter what we're going through, God, this is just a short time. For soon we'll be home with you. So let us not lose sight of that hope. Let us not lose sight of your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to be going over the book of Philemon there in the New Testament. So if you have your Bible, if you will open to near the back of the New Testament, right before you get to the book of Hebrews, and join us to the big old book of Philemon, all of 25 verses long, only one chapter, big old book of Philemon. So turn, if you would, to the book of Philemon. To give you a, a quick overview, I'm just going to walk through the book of Philemon and talk about some things. But one of the main things that we need to discuss and talk about with the book of Philemon is this issue of uh, slavery in the Old and New Testament. Because the story, just a, a quick overview of Philemon. Philemon is a pretty uh, wealthy merchant, pretty wealthy businessman that we know that is helping one of the early churches that Paul is hosting one of the early churches uh, that Paul established. And he has a slave, Onesimus, and his slave escapes and apparently steals some money. And Paul is making a plea Onesimus is going to come back to Philemon, and Paul is making a plea that he accept Onesimus as his brother, as someone that is in the ministry helping Paul out. So we look at slavery in the Bible, and there's an important distinction we need to make. Slavery within the Old and New Testament, slavery back during these days, is a little bit different than the kind of slavery we know. There's slavery that was uh, because of somebody was captured uh, during wartime. But there was also the slavery uh, indentured servitude. So back in these times, they didn't have credit and debit. They didn't really have much of IOUs. If you owed someone and owed someone enough, their family owed someone enough, and if you were without money, then you would enter into a time where you would just say, I would serve them. I would become their servant. I would pay back what I owe to this. So that's what we... Perceive that's what's going on with Onesimus, that he is indebted to Philemon at this time. But he runs away from Philemon. And one of the differences that the Bible takes 
with slavery is that it humanizes and it puts forth effort to free slaves and treat them as humans as well. It's not just going through and saying this is just your property, but this is a human life that is valued, just like you. And Paul takes it a step further to say, this is not who he formerly was, this is your brother in Christ. Gives a new identity to who Onesimus, who was a slave, now he's saying he is your brother in Christ. He joins you in the kingdom of God. So join with me if you would, uh, we're going to start in verse 4 of Philemon, and we're just going to walk through uh, the book, but kind of going back and forth, but just starting there in verse 4. So verse 4, I always thank my God when I mention you in my prayers, this is Paul talking to Philemon, because I hear of your love and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ for all the saints. I pray that your participation in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. I want to pause there for a second. As we gather for church together, as we are the church if you're a believer watching this, you're part of the kingdom of God. And no matter who you are and what gifts and abilities we have, we all have the ability to embolden each other's faith, to encourage each other's faith. Paul is in prison during this time and he's writing to Philemon saying, I have heard of what you're doing with the church. I've heard of the things going on and that emboldens me, that em that refreshes my soul to hear about what you're doing for the saints, to hear about what you're doing for the church members. That encourages me. That emboldens my faith. Billy Graham once said, courage is contagious. When a brave man takes a stand, the spines of other men begin to stiffen. We need as believers to encourage each other because that becomes contagious. As a church, as Bunker Hill, as everyone that comes in, your faith can encourage and embolden and help others and propel others in their faith. And likewise, when you hear of what's going on with someone else and what they're doing, it encourages you to take a stand, for you to be bold. So when we are bold, it emboldens others. So we have a responsibility, no, what we're, no matter what we're doing, no matter what gifts we're given and encouragement, we have an obligation to help others. There's been times in your life where you've been low in the valley and you've heard, and you know people are praying for you and you've heard about other stuff going on and you wanna be a part of that and it helps you rise above. God gives us people in our lives, stories that we hear of faith to help our own faith through. So no matter who you are watching this, your faith can encourage others. And so listen to the stories of others and let them encourage you. Continuing on in verse 8. For this reason, although I have great boldness in Christ to command you to do what is right, I appeal instead on the basis of love. Paul I, Paul, an elderly man, now a prisoner of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus, appeal to you, my child, whom my father will and change on this. So, I want to stop there for a second. Go back and look at how Paul greets Philemon in this letter. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Notice in this how he addresses Philemon. Not as Paul the minister, not as Paul the missionary, not as Paul the church founder, but Paul the elderly man, Paul the prisoner. There are times that messages need to be given that need to step on toes. There are times when plain truth needs to be spoken. And there are times when we need to appeal to each other. And every leader of the church, not just those in the ministry, but every Sunday school teacher, 
every leader, every deacon needs to hear this message. That there are times to speak truth boldly, and there are times to appeal the truth. Paul is saying, I don't want to do this. I don't want to speak to you, down to you. But instead, I want you to do this of your own free will. Continuing on, I'm sending him, uh, go back to verse 11. Once he was useless to you, and now he is useful to both you and me. I'm sending to you as a part of myself back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that in my imprisonment for the gospel, he may serve me in your place but i didn't want to do anything without your consent so that your good deed may not be out of obligation but of your own free will we do a lot of things out of obligation we do things because we're told to do so either as a parent or you remember being told when your parent when you would ask dad why do i do this mom why are we doing this because i told you so that that's that works at the moment. But we need to remember that even our Lord and Savior came down and made an appeal to us, showed us how to do it, showed us the way. There's a difference when, as a parent, you tell them to do so and you show them and you sit down with them and you explain why. And there's times they have to do it because of you told them to do so. It's like the difference of you can tell them to go clean your clean their room. Or you can say you have a friend coming over that you may want your room clean. How clean is that room going to be when you explain the details? When you explain your life? When you make an appeal to someone so that they do something because they want to? How much of our own Christian life is out of obligation versus that we want to? That we see the need to. Like I said, our Lord and Savior didn't just leave us with the Old Testament. But we have a New Testament because he came and he served and he died. He made an appeal to each and every one of us. Spoke truth plainly. But showed us the way. And so there are times that yes, we need to speak and we need to preach. But more often than not, we need to appeal. Appeal to our community, appeal to each other, appeal to believers and non-believers. We need to show them the gospel in our life and make that appeal to them. Yes, we can stand firm on the word of God and speak truth. But we can also appeal to everyone in our community. And show them the way, as our Lord and Savior has shown us the way. One thing I want to mention going back, Onesimus, one thing that's kind of funny, just kind of in there. He says, once he was useless to you, Onesimus means useful. So he was saying once he was out of his usefulness. Once this man who was called useful became useless. He ran away from you, but now he's useful. Go back to... Verse 15, for perhaps this is why he separated from you for a brief time so that you might get him back permanently, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a dearly loved brother. This is especially so to me, but even more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So consider me a partner and accept him as you would me. For if he has wronged you in any way or he owes you anything, Charge it to my account. I, Paul, write this letter in my own hand, and I will repay it, not to mention to you that you owe me even of your own self. Paul is saying, don't no longer identify Onesimus in what he's done or who he was, but I identify him as a brother in Christ who has helped be a missionary, who has helped spread the gospel, that has helped. Paul, no longer as what he did or who he was, but who his new identity is. 
So often when we sit in churches, we come together as believers. When we go throughout our community and we know someone's a believer, we still see them as who they were or what they've done to us. And we, 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 we filter them through that identity. But Paul is saying, if you no longer see him as who he was, we need to no longer see each and every one in our community as who they were, but brothers and sisters in Christ here in the kingdom, because that's going to be their identity throughout eternity, not what they've done to us, but who they belong to and where their identity now lies. Yes, they may have wronged us. Yes, they may have done bad. But God will use them. And we need to believe that God knows better than us. And God has plans for everyone. And though they may have wronged us or though we have looked down on them in the past, they are no longer their past. We are no longer past. You are no longer your past. You are no longer your mistakes. You are God's. You are his child. Your identity is in him, not your past mistakes. So we need to treat each other in the same way and not identify them as who they were, what they've done, but whose they are and what they're doing for him. Finally, Paul writes back in verse 21, since I am confident of your obedience, I am writing, to, uh, since I am confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say, but meanwhile also prepare a guest room for me, for I hope through your prayers I will be restored to you. Paul is saying, get ready, because I'm coming to see you. I have faith that I will not be about this situation. We're in a very weird place in 2020. We're under a virus. Some of us are still under quarantine, staying at home. We don't know what's going on. We don't know what's happening in this moment. Paul was sitting in prison, not knowing of what's going on, but he was still writing letters of encouragement to church members. He was still preaching the gospel to fellow prisoners. And he was saying to those he was writing to, I'm coming to see you. I'm trapped in this moment. I am stuck in this prison, but I will not be here long. We will not be in this situation long in 2020, but we need to continue to preach the gospel, show the gospel to the community, even if it's virtually, even if it's over a phone call, whatever we need to do, we need to say as believers, we are not about this situation. We are not only in the presence, but we have hope in the future and we will spread that hope throughout this moment will not contain bunker hill baptist church this moment will not contain the kingdom of christ but we will be, be victorious in this moment because we are the victors and he has prepared our room he has prepared us a place and we are not a prisoner to just this moment. But we are his. We are victorious. And this moment will not define us. 2020 and this virus and everything about it will not keep us down. We will march forward. We will celebrate. We will worship no matter where we are or whatever happens we will still worship and encourage because we are his and we will not be stopped and i pray you find encouragement to continue on and encourage believers don't let the enemy whisper that you are what you've done. You are God's. You are his child. Spread that good news. And may your faith be contagious to each and every one. And I pray if you're watching this tonight, you will get down and, and not know what's going on and you're not sure about this moment and you're not sure of your, your own salvation. Believe me, you can look at Paul's situation and know that a prison would not contain his joy. Do you have that kind of joy? 
do you know that you belong to God as well? Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for each and every one that has watched. God, I pray if there's anyone watching that does not know if they belong to you, that they will turn their life over to you. And God, I pray for each and every believer that is watching this tonight. That they would be encouraged by Paul's message. That though he is in prison, he is not a prisoner of the moment. He is still a victorious child of Christ. And I pray we all look at that situation. Though we are in a bad situation at the moment, we are not a prisoner of this moment. We are yours. May we continue to march on and proclaim your gospel. In your name we pray. Amen.